welcome back to the show. We're going to be talking about cold fusion practical digital accessibility with Bouton Jones. I, I think I just made a meal of your name there. Not the Jones. Bouton. The, it's Bouton, yes. <laughs> I practiced it three times before we hit record, but <clears throat> I still managed to screw it up. <clears throat> but I heard every possible variation. <laughs> well, that's good. Um, so we're going to be looking at what accessibility actually means and a lot of those things you may not have thought of before and also we're going to look at how this presentation you're giving at cf summit on practical digital accessibility is different from other accessibility talks people may have seen before and there's some interesting stuff in it i just uh, been talking with you uh, about it and there's some stuff i've already learned and i gave a talk on this topic 15 years ago so just goes to show you can always learn new stuff. And uh, we'll look at why it's so important and what you can do to make your Cold Fusion apps even more accessible. And some of those are things you definitely have not thought of. So stay tuned and welcome, Bouton. Thank you. Thank you. So we, we just help us understand what, what exactly is accessibility? Well, I, I think of accessibility as a component of usability, but it's specific to those uh, of us who have disabilities. Uh, we need extra help uh, accessing what the rest of us take for granted. Uh, I myself, I think uh, the fact that I wear a pair of glasses in a way shows that I have a disability but uh, I take it for granted that I have this wonderful technology on my face. And so I don't need uh, extra technology to take care of that. That is uh, a good way to look at it. And I bet a lot of people listening have some kind of assistive technology or some kind of disability. What, what other disabilities uh, you know, do people have that we should be paying attention to? Well, I think the most common that we, we think of is uh, blind users, uh, people who can't hear, uh, but there's also uh, people who have English as a second language, uh, that is a disability, a disadvantage, uh, people on the autism spectrum, uh, people who are dyslexic. Um, and yeah, I'll raise my hand on the dyslexic one. I, I, I've had that for many years. I well, cover I, up well. I, I, I use spell checkers all the time. <laughs> I, I, I cannot survive without spell checkers. Uh, spell checkers have made me uh, the man I am today. It's uh, prevented me from standing behind the McDonald's counter asking people if they want fries with that. Uh, yeah. So I, I love uh, spell checkers. I owe so much to them. And then what, what other disabilities maybe people are less aware of? Well, one that people often don't think of is uh, manual dexterity. Uh, mm. Not everyone can use a mouse. Some people uh, must use something else. Uh, uh, the tab key, for instance. Mm. Uh, but uh, think of someone like... Well, and yeah, someone like Stephen Hawking can't use a mouse. And, and anyone who's blind can't use a mouse. So you know, a lot of people can't use mice. So it's very important, uh, for one thing, that your website uh, can be navigated and forms can be filled out without the use of a mouse. Mm. And then um, there's some other ones, colorblind. My father's colorblind. So, you know, if you if you... That means you might have two colors that to a normal person, they can tell the difference, but they look the same to them. Or even uh, sometimes uh, someone wants a color scheme, a uh, color palette for the website, and which mm -hmm. the, uh, the background color and the foreground color are, are very much similar. Uh, I was watching a slideshow uh, uh, months ago in a session at a conference. And uh, from the back of the room, it would take me uh, several seconds in order to read, figure out what the, uh, what the title of the slide was. Wow. 
Yeah. And one other thing I, I like to be aware of is some people have epile epilepsy and if there's a lot of flashing and stuff going on in your app, um, hopefully people aren't using that flash tag anymore in their apps, but the, the, the blink tag. Yes. Blink. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Don't use in that. an early draft of my presentation. I was, I, I wrote, uh, do not use the blink tag. And then in parentheses, I wrote, does anyone still use the blink tag? I, I hope not, but they might have flashy graphics going on possibly. So I, I know you've really gone into this accessibility thing and I, I looked at the, I had a sneak peek at the slides you're going to be revealing in your talk and you, you've got really a lot of research you've done into this. What, what led you to get interested in accessibility? Well, I've been interested in it for years. Um, for a long time, I thought I was very good at accessibility. It was one of those skills that, uh, that I prodded myself in. It seemed that uh, every job interview, and I was a contractor for 10 years, so I had numerous job interviews. It seemed like every job interview, I would be asked about accessibility, and I would give a very nice pat answer that seemed to satisfy uh, my potential employers and my employers. But it was something that was rarely ever followed through upon. Uh, mm. It was never really part of a quality assurance review. Uh, I was never, uh, I, I was hoping that uh, my accessibility was so good that there was no reason to criticize it, but uh, maybe that was too hopeful. But um, about two years ago, I met uh, a gentleman, uh, David Ondick, in Austin, Texas. He is the ADA pro program manager. And I, uh, I told him about my interest in accessibility, and he told me about <coughs> his compelling need to, for accessibility because he was a user, is a user of access, uh, assistive technology. And through this discussion, I realized that there was a whole lot more about accessibility, not just web accessibility, but PDFs and office documents that I was totally unaware of. And um, mm. he, in turn, uh, benefited from me explaining uh, why things were so strange, why he would get uh, a PDF and an email attachment and it would be blank, <clears throat> mm. even though to myself as a sighted user, it wasn't. Mm. So, uh, well, we'll, we, we'll we'll talk more about those other file formats a bit a bit later, um, because that is something people may not have thought about. That perhaps their app is sending out emails or has PDFs or documentation, okay. and they hadn't even considered to make that accessible. Well, as a web developer, uh, PDFs never occurred to me. Uh, someone will send me a PDF and I'll post it online. And I won't, uh, it never occurred to me that uh, I was posting something inaccessible. Mm. Uh, so but, congratul congratulations talking at CF Summit um, and you're talking on accessibility, but you know, some of us listening have probably heard an accessibility talk before um, and figured, oh yeah, we've got this all figured out. How, how is your talk gonna be different? Well, uh, when I was working with, uh, out of these discussions I was having with uh, David Ondick, uh, mm -hmm. we decided to collaborate on a presentation on accessibility in which he would explain uh, the, the, uh, the needs for accessibility but he would also explain his experiences in accessibility. And I would illustrate these experiences by, uh, by uh, displaying these documents, these PDFs, and also giving uh, sound recordings of uh, the actual accessibility of these, uh, these documents. So my, mm. this presentation is an outgrowth instead of having a presentation that is uh, from the perspective of a user of assistive technology, in other words, this is the technology I use, this is what, 
what I do, this is what it sounds like, or the perspective of a developer, this is what you do correctly, this is what you do wrong. I combine the two. So there is uh, more significance, there's a correlation. You can see what the result of uh, bad coding is, and you can hear what the result of good coding is. Mm. So why is accessibility so important today? Well, I think it's only going to become more important as uh, particularly in North America as our population ages, um, as our uh, vision uh, decreases. Um, there's an estimate that about 20% uh, of the North American population is, has disabilities of some sort. Imagine if your website was a brick and mortar storefront and you had an employee in the front of the store, you don't remember hiring him, but he's an employee, who is turning away one out of the very five of your potential customers, telling them, uh, we don't value your business, uh, you're too much difficulty for us to deal with, we think you're insignificant, uh, and just go somewhere else. And that's what happens when you have an inaccessible website. Mm. But I think primarily, the primary reason is because we as cold fusion developers, we can describe our role, our responsibility in one word, communicate. It's our responsibility to communicate information for our clients, for our businesses, for our organizations. And if we, when we fail to communicate to uh, part of our audience, that's a failure in our duty. Mm. I mean, it's also, I think, a moral thing. You know, it's yes. it's not very nice to have an app and then a bunch of people who use it have difficulty using it or can't use it at all. Mm. Um, and there's uh, the legal argument. Um, a lot of people say, well, uh, I'm sure uh, our site is, is accessible enough and we can win any court case, but my feeling is it's much easier and cheaper uh, not to go to court than to win a uh, accessibility case. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, do any, are there any guidelines that relate to this? Or? Well, the, the, the uh, W3C uh, has uh, guidelines that are uh, in North America particularly uh, accepted uh, as a legal standard. And uh, I'm sure it's, it's accept, accepted worldwide as the de facto standard for accessibility. Uh, I would uh, rather have people uh, look at those guidelines and follow them than rather to discuss the uh, legal uh, uh, the legal questions. Uh, it's just simpler to just make an accessible site rather than worry whether or not uh, you're going to be party to a lawsuit. Absolutely. So wh what are some of the practical things people should be looking at to make their cold fusion app accessible and, and let's include some of the things they may not have thought of well the thing about the cold fusion is it's mostly a back-end technology while accessibility is mostly a problem on the front end uh, but you would want to have a fully accessible uh, HTML uh, markup I would suggest using semantic HTML. Uh, making sure that uh, your site can be navigated without the use of a mouse. Uh, I would test with a screen reader. Actually, I would test with more than one screen reader. And I would make sure that uh, the those who can't see are able to appreciate uh, fully appreciate your website. Uh, 
if there's any uh, audio or video, there should be a transcript available or captions. Mm. Uh, also something that uh, I myself uh, often overlook or used to overlook is, uh, is your additional media accessible? If you have PDFs or Word documents or PowerPoint slides posted on your website, are they accessible in themselves? As a cold fusion developer, uh, my attitude used to be, uh, well, someone gave me this content, I'll just post it. And I assumed that uh, they knew what they were doing. And they probably assumed I knew what they were doing. And it's not necessarily accessible. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, a website that has a lot of uh, legal documents that have been signed, uh, say uh, corporate policies or uh, departmental policies that need signatures. Often what happens is uh, someone prints out that document, it's signed by uh, an executive, it's scanned and then posted. But it's, as far as a blind user is concerned, that's a blank document. Mm. Right, because they can't read, they, the screen reader can't read a graphic. Yes, currently. it's um, not really. If, it, if, if the PDF contained actual text, they could screen read the text. Yes. Another, uh, another pitfall, uh, I used to do this all the time. Uh, I'd have a Word document or a web page, and I would uh, print to PDF. So the text of that document was saved to a PDF, but all the navigation, all the semantic mm -hmm. markup is lost. Mm -hmm it's better to export a Word document to PDF. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess having any flash or other rich internet stuff is, is a problem as well. Well, anyone still using flash, there's one more reason not to use it and that uh, it's, uh, it's very problematic as far as accessibility is concerned. Yeah. Um, and then, are there any things you know you, that can help out? I mean, I've heard of skip links. Tell us what that is. What well, skip links, um, it's a link often hidden. Uh, it's the first link in uh, the uh, DOM tree. And so uh, that way the uh, blind user doesn't have to listen to all the links in the header and the navigation pane. Uh, the first link, they can just follow that and go directly to the content. Mm. One pitfall, however, for that is uh, designers don't like skip links to be visible. They're mm. uh, a distraction, they're a complication, they're something that uh, most of us don't see the need for. And so the skip link is hidden so that it will be read aloud by the screen reader but won't be visible to the rest of us. Now, that's great for, for everyone who doesn't use a mouse. Um, so if you have skip links, you should be able to activate them with a tab key so that as soon as you visit a website and hit the tab key, the skip link will appear. And then you can press enter and go to the content that would benefit those people who don't use mouse, like Stephen Hawking. Right. Who may be coming to your website, you never know. <laughs> and then um, captures are another issue, right? If you have one of those image captures, mm -hmm. of course that isn't gonna work for someone mm -hmm. who's blind. And some of those image captures are hard for people with normal sight to use, to be honest. Oh, I, I often have to go through those captures three or four times before before I uh, I use them correctly. Um, one strategy, if you have to uh, use captures, is instead of having a, a weird, distorted picture of letters and numbers, put a math 
program there. Mm -hmm. uh, one plus two plus three and equals, and then uh, the uh, non-computer, the uh, actual user can put in six. Mm -hmm. uh, Google, uh, Google also has a, a service, uh, ReCAPTCHA, mm -hmm which uh, they'll provide you an API and you can use that. And it has an embedded uh, link to uh, read the CAPTCHA aloud for, oh. for the uh, line users. Well, those are great solutions. Anything else in Gulf Fusion apps that we should pay attention to or that you found surprising when you, you looked into this? Well, last year, um, I attended at the Cold Fusion Summit a presentation by Steve uh, Shinney. Uh, he was talking about uh, accessibility and in specific about the MCML uh, master control markup language, which was a library of custom tags that he created for his employer. And it was a great way of forcing accessibility uh, on uh, the uh, front end developers and, uh, and all the developers when you have a large website. Uh, mm. Unfortunately, that, uh, that had a lot of proprietary, those custom tags had a lot of proprietary uh, information in them. So they're not publicly available. But I think that is a great uh, idea that uh, hopefully someone will pursue and, and make uh, publicly available uh, uh, a bunch of uh, a CFC with a bunch of custom tags that force accessibility. I think that's a mm -hmm. great idea that uh, it's time I hope will come soon. Well, we'll put the link to his slides into the show notes along with um, there was a talk I gave many years ago at MDCFUG together with John Brundage on uh, accessibility and one Ray Camden has given on this. So we'll put all those in, in the episode show notes. So we've looked at, at what you need to do in your code and we talked a little bit about, you know, how other files that may, may be in your app like PDFs or Word documents. What about email or social media that you, you have in, link in your app? Well, I didn't want to spend too much time on social media because um, I think that's uh, uh, not so beneficial for cold fusion developers. Uh, but emails, uh, one thing I didn't include in, in, in the slides, which I'd like to mention, is if, you're, uh, if you know you're communicating with a blind user, rather than uh, embed a URL, in your email, uh, embed it as a hyperlink. Mm. Because otherwise, uh, your, your blind user has to listen to this long drawn, drawn out address uh, that means nothing to him. However, if you embed a hyperlink, it's just a little bit more work. Uh, that'll be something that uh, he can actually use and understand. Mm. That, that's a great tip. There's one other thing that applies to all these things that we haven't really talked about, and that's the the language that you use in the in the copy and text of emails or or in the website itself. And we mentioned right at the beginning that you know some people are autistic or their English is not their first language. Um, so simplifying the language that's used. Well. It Accessibility is just one more reason to use a uh, simple language. Um, mm -hmm. Don't use language that's more complicated than necessary. And I think a lot of us, uh, uh, myself, when I was going to college, uh, we had a tendency to try to use long winded words and we didn't necessarily communicate better. We just thought it made us sound, sound more intelligent. But the truth is, and uh, the uh, Nielsen Norman group uh, had a paper on this recently, an article, uh, using simple jargon-free language actually makes you seem more intelligent. 
and can it be appreciated by those with uh, advanced degrees? Uh, these are people who, uh, like all of us, they're busy. They need to get the information quickly. And long, rambling sentences are not the ways to do that. Right. And, and that affects not just accessibility, it also affects if you have a, a sales page, it affects your conversion rate or it affects how long people stay on your site. So yes. And it also affects uh, the uh, search engine optimization. Mm. Um, mm. Search engines can review your site and more accurately or succinctly if you're using uh, jargon free language. Great. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, how your talk goes. And I think this is an important topic. So appreciate you, you talking about it. Let, let's talk about some other things related to cold fusion before we close the episode. So, you know, share with us why you're proud to use cold fusion. Well, I, I love cold fusion. Uh, I started as a web uh, designer and it was so easy to uh, bootstrap my way from uh, web design into web development using Cold Fusion. I think it's underappreciated language. Uh, I think it's uh, powerful. Um, I, I, I wish it didn't have this reputation. People thinking of, oh, Cold Fusion, is that still around? Well, it is around. Uh, it's a great way of creating uh, dynamic, strong, scalable applications. Great. And, well, sorry, go ahead. You had something else. No, that was it. Okay. So, uh, you know, I'm all for that. I mean, that's why I titled the podcast CF Alive, because I think we need mm -hmm. to make Cold Fusion more alive and recognize it is a modern language if you use mm -hmm. the right tools and techniques like you're talking about here with the accessibility angle. Um, so what would it take uh, to make Cold Fusion more alive this year? Well, um, whenever I go to these conferences, uh, there are people who are, are uh, complaining that Cold Fusion has this reputation of being dead. And uh, we are telling each other uh, that it's not dead. And we're telling each other that it's great. But really what we, need to do, what we need to know is how we can tell other people who are not Cold Fusion developers, how to let them understand that it is a dynamic living language, uh, powerful with a future and a past. And we need to know how to, to sell it to our clients and our bosses. That is a great point. In fact, I did an interview on the podcast uh, and I'll link that in the show notes about how to sell cold fusion and, and the ROI of, of cold fusion development. That, so I'll, I'll put that one in. That would be a great session. And if that was presented at, uh, at uh, CF United or Adobe cold fusion conference, that would draw a crowd. I, I think it's an important topic. So talking of CF Summit, what are you looking forward to at this year's CF Summit? I'm looking forward to learning more about Cold Fusion. Uh, I'm looking forward to meeting uh, Cold Fusion developers. Uh, uh, and uh, knowing that it's still alive, that there are still people excited about it. That's what I'm looking forward to. Well, fabulous. Well, with 500 uh, CFers all gathered together, I'm sure you're going to achieve that. So if folks wanted to find you online, what's the best way to do that? Well, I was fortunate in that I was able to secure the domain boutonjones.com. That's B-O-U-T-O-N-J-O-N-E-S.com. Uh, Excellent. Well, we, we will put that in the show notes and also we're going to link to the slides that you, you have. Um, and also I'm putting in some of the uh, videos that uh, you, you're going to share so people can check out how uh, 
uh, to do some of these things. So thanks so much for coming on to the podcast and for staying up so late in Austin, Texas to make it happen. So. It's my pleasure.